Hey everybody. Why do I always smack my desk when I said, hey everybody. <laughs> hey, punch. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to hurt you. Hello. Welcome to the Evening Reader. My name is Priscilla. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> it's been that kind of week. Yeah. So, how is everybody doing out there? I hope that you're doing well. Uh, it's the end of the week. <laughs> it's hot here in the Netherlands. It's really warm. Well, it's like it's like 27, 28 Celsius, which is like low 80s. So I'm saying it's warm. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's it's not terrible. It's not terrible, but we have a very extended stretch of high temperatures coming. It's going to be in the low 30s this weekend, so that means up around 90. And it's just, and it, this kind of trend goes on. This is like August temperatures, and it goes on for the next week or two with no rain. This is very unusual, very, very unusual for the Netherlands. So, yeah, I'm like, if I wanted this, if I wanted this weather, I could have just stayed in Atlanta. Thank you. But, oh well. Oh well. You know, I don't have to deal with guns or Trump, so I guess I guess I'm doing just fine. So I will not complain. Uh, just here to do kind of a um, a general catch up, and then I do have one thing that I want to talk about. That I want to talk about um, that is sort of a uh, I'm always waving this hand around. I've that in my videos it's like this hand. It's like, hi. Um, yeah, kind of a, I, I don't want to call it a pet peeve, but I guess it is kind of a literary pet peeve, but I will get to that uh, sort of at the end. Last week when I did my video, was it last week? And I was talking about June reads and all the books that I had bought. And now everybody's talking about book buying, not because I talked about books that I had bought, but just because the, there have been several videos, um, about book pricing. Uh, Ann Novella had put up a video about book pricing and there were a lot of response videos and um, a lot of people talking about their book buying habits. Anyway, on that video that I did last week, I forgot to mention that I had bought some other books. <laughs> I think I forgot to mention some of the books that I bought. Yeah, so I was gonna mention that. I don't remember if I mentioned these. Maybe I did, but I'm not gonna go back and watch my video. So I got these this week. They came in the mail. I'm sorry. I cannot wait to open the package until I start this video. I'm going to just open it up. So I got um, Claire Ditterer's Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma. Uh, I, Sarah at Hardcover Hearts talked about this. I, I think I talked about that. Maybe. Uh, she really loved it. She gave it high praise. Um, so did Renee at Left-Handed Reader. She really liked it. I'm just very fascinated by this topic, and I'm I'm really interested in diving into this uh, sort of it's an exploration on whether or not you know we can separate the art from the artist. I guess uh, you know. So if somebody is a terrible person, is it still okay to like their art? I am, I, this is fascinating because I think there are a lot of people probably who we, we have revered and loved for a long time and who have become part of the cultural zeitgeist who were maybe not great people. And maybe pe there's maybe people that aren't great and we just don't even know about it. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm very, I'm very fascinated by that. I'm interested to read that one. The other thing I got, and you, this sucks, you guys. Look at this. What is this? This is a hardcover. This is a nice hardcover. And it looks like it was, it's got, that's just glued on there. That's cardboard from, and I can't, I don't want to rip the cover. But I got the Sleeping Car Porter, which won the Giller Prize, the Scotiabank Giller Prize this year um, by Suzette Meyer. And this, um, Mayor, Mayor, Meyer, Mayor, uh, <laughs> I heard about this um, Sean, from Sean the Book Maniac, and then also from Brian. Um... God, Brian, your channel name just went right out. 
and bookish Jackson. And bookish. I'm so god. Okay, it's been a week, man. It's been a week. So I've heard good things about this, so I thought that I would go ahead and pick this one up. Uh, because you know, maybe just yeah, for Pride Month. I don't know. Yeah. It's looked looked really good to me. Another one that I picked up uh, because our <laughs> Eric Carl Anderson, a lonesome reader, had raved about this last week, and he said it was so good that he immediately turned back to the beginning of the book and read it again. And I'm always when somebody says they've done that, I I think okay, I have to check it out. So this is In Ascension by Martin McInnes. I don't know much about it. I'll link Eric's video below so that you can listen to him just rhapsodize about this book. Uh, I was, may, I am maybe still going to do this as a buddy read with a subscriber, Ed, and um, subscriber, comma, Ed, not subscriber, Ed. Um, <laughs> and But he said that he started it and it reminded him of I get these two books confused. The Overstory, The Understory, The Overstory, I think, by Powers, R Richard Powers, Richard Powers. I get Richard Powers and Robert McFarlane confused. Are those, yeah, I think that's right. There's the Overstory and The Understory. Anyway, anyway. So he wasn't sure if uh, he wanted to, maybe to continue. So I'm not sure if he's going to want to do that buddy read, but I'm going to read this regardless. And maybe I will be buddy reading something else with him. So, in a session. And I, I realize I'm not telling you what these are about, but I've got I've got other stuff to talk about today. So, uh, the other one. So this is now in November, and uh, I got this because I heard uh, D talking about it, a novel idea, and we thought maybe we would buddy read this. Her copy had this beautiful cover. I will. Yeah, do the trick. And um, this is the cover that I got because I got this. It was cheaper. <laughs> that other one was like 20 something euro. This is paperback. And this was like 760 euro. And this is the, this is the British um, edition. Uh, this is by Josephine Johnson. This one, the Pulitzer in the, this one, the Pulitzer sometime. I want to say in the 30s. I don't know if that's right. Let me look. I don't know. 34. Yeah, 1934. So, but, so this is a story, though, about the Dust Bowl, about a woman in the Depression. <laughs> and, uh, like, does this look like the Dust Bowl to you? This looks like Monet or maybe, like, Van, Van Gogh. Ugh trying to do it the Dutch way. This is the cover. This is the fly leaf. It's beautiful. It's it's very pretty. Um, but this looks like an impressionist painting of the Dutch countryside or, or the French countryside. It does not look like somebody in hardship in the middle of the United States. But even more fascinating, you're gonna you're just not gonna believe it when I tell you this painting. This is a painting by Jackson Pollock. This is a painting by the American painter Jackson Pollock. Yes, the splatter paint guy. Yes, the my five-year-old could do that guy. This is his painting and it says it's from 1933, I believe. And I was just blown away. Yeah, Man with Hand Plow, 1933. So he had studied art. He had uh, obviously he had studied art and he didn't start by painting you know abstract art really fascinating yeah okay that's that's that so do you let me know if you want to if we're still on for that sometime maybe july august <laughs> 2024 <laughs> since since she also bought a whole bunch of books and who knows who knows when things are going to happen right and then i think i mentioned that i bought or that I was gonna read uh, Sarah Waters' Affinity, but I've only got two Sarah Waters I hadn't read, and I got that copy, and I was very excited because the copy that I ordered, that was the photo on the order that I placed, was just 
just ugly. This is really ugly. I mean, you could tell it was going to be one of those shiny covers and it had like a stock photo on it of like a necklace, like a, like a choker type necklace or something. And this is black and then, yeah. But I got this cover instead, and I really love these covers. I like, I really love the uh, font and the sort of like um, mid 20th century look and feel the colors. So that this is a whole series that this is Virago uh, that Virago had reissued all of her books like the her in paperback like this with these covers, and I think these come with the hardback too. Uh, but I really love this cover so. That came in and so I'm looking forward to reading this I like Sarah Waters it, okay uh, what's been going on what has been going on oh, I just want to move my tripod I bumped it I didn't mean to um oh so I'm reading Lonesome Dove oh I don't have my copy I have my copy with me to hold up I'm reading Lonesome Dove I'm about um, a third of the way through Lonesome Dove I'm just savoring it and enjoying it because I love Larry McMurtry. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm supposed to be buddy reading it with Randy Ray from Literate Texan, but, uh, you know, I think he's had some things going on and, uh, I know he's reading, um, uh, but we haven't worked out yet how we're going to, um, sort of like get together and talk about the book or if we're going to, if we're going to do it at the end of the month or if we're going to, you know, have little check-ins. I'm not sure. So I won't talk too much about the book except to say it's wonderful. It is better than I even remembered. Uh, and I'm loving it. And it's also making me think I need to go back and read um, Walter Benjamin at the Dairy Queen, which is probably the closest thing that Larry McMurtry wrote to a uh, memoir. But in that, he talks about writing Lonesome Dove and about how he actually conceived of Lonesome Dove as the anti-Western. He was trying to de-romanticize the cowboy life. And he was sort of, sort of like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> Everybody, you know, next thing he knows, everyone's like, that's my favorite Western of all time. <laughs> and he, he was really trying to not, you know, <laughs> make it not that his whole you know his family he grew up on a cattle ranch his uh all of his uncles uh were you know many of his uncles were cowboys and he you know he saw the downside or the sort of just everydayness of it and really wasn't sure why people romanticized the american west and that that life that really lonely life the way that they did and so that that was part of what set him in mind to write Lonesome Dove. So uh, I want to go back and read that because I don't totally remember everything that he had to say about it, but I think it would be interesting for the conversation. And also, it's just, I've read it a couple of times already. It's, it's just a really great memoir slash book of essays um, from Larry McMurtry. So if you like Larry McMurtry, I highly recommend it. Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and I was going to spend a little more time on this today, so I don't want to, didn't want to drag everything else out so that I could kind of talk about this. So the other book that I'm reading right now is um, a novel, Christadora, by Tim Murphy. And that is a book um, set largely in New York City during the 1980s and 1990s uh, during the AIDS crisis. And apparently Murphy was a journalist, or is a journalist, I should say. I don't know if he is still writing as a journalist. He may just be a novelist now. Uh, and he reported for something like 20 years. He reported on the H HIV AIDS crisis in the United States. And I guess took a lot of what he learned and put some of it into this novel. So, uh, I've had the book for a long time. I bought it a long time ago. It's got pretty good ratings. You know, I don't know. All that, none of that matters, I guess. I'm about 50% of the way through. It's a multi-point of view, multi-timeline. Both of those things are things that I really enjoy in a novel. But I want to talk today about a thing that this author keeps doing that is something I don't enjoy. 
And there, there are actually two things that are sort of bothering me about the book. And one thing I'm just suspending judgment on because, I'm, again, I'm only 50% of the way through and I don't want to... Uh, it, this may be something that resolves itself later in the book. Uh, the first issue, which is, you know, something about having to do with the characters. But I do want to talk about something that this author is doing, and I have seen it, I've seen a lot of authors doing this, and especially over the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years, it feels like it's become more of a thing. Maybe that's just me, or maybe I'm noticing it more. And that is um, really relying heavily on pop culture references. Uh, this book has a ton of pop culture references or yeah no it is mostly pop culture I mean we're talking like movies tv shows bands um things that you know fashion all these types of things very specific very specific pop culture references in this book and I want to say that's not something that I'm against in general. It doesn't, that doesn't bother me, but I do think, you know, that if it's going to be there, it needs to serve a real purpose for the story. And I know that especially literary fiction writers who, if you read books about writing and, you know, all these books about writing or writing advice that you would get from instructors or mentors would, you know, is really focus on concrete detail, focus on, you know, you want to have like verisimilitude, you know, you want everything to seem real and real life. Uh, you don't want it to seem implausible. You want the detail to sort of lend themselves to the character's life. And that's, you know, all true. And I can see why some authors, you know, do, a lot of authors do, you know, will make pop culture references or, you know, reference songs or books or movies or things in the books to sort of, you know, maybe it's dialogue point or maybe it's something about the character, it's their favorite thing. And I think when that's done sort of sparingly, or I think if it's done like at the right moment, uh, and or again, if it informs the character, or if it somehow informs the the actual what's happening in the story, uh, there's some alignment that it works really well. It can work really well, and you don't notice it. But what's happening in this book is this author just is just dropping these pop culture references and brands, like brand names, just again and again and again, like every every few pages it feels like sometimes. And it's gotten to be where I, I'm, I'm, I've got notes. I'm taking notes in my Kindle, like I'm highlighting and I'm like, why? What? Why? <laughs> and I'll give you some examples. I'll give you some examples. One thing, okay, so there's a point, and, and none of this is really spoilers. Uh, these are not, I'm, I'm, I'm picking out things that are not, that are not spoilers. They're not huge plot points. Or if they are plot points, then I will, I'm not going to tell you what the thing is. So, for example, there's a point in the book and a scene that I just read, and one of the main characters who, her name is Millie, She's one of the main point of view characters. She's talking to her best friend, Drew. Um, and Millie has just learned something that is sort of life-changing or could be life-changing. And she has to make a decision. And she's talking to her friend, Drew. Uh, they're talking long distance. There's a gnat. I'm, so, I'm not that crazy. She's talking to her friend, Drew. And... <laughs> I promise there is actually a Nat, um, who lives in California. Millie lives in New York. And, you know, there's one line. They're on the phone together, and there's this line that says, Millie could hear Radiohead playing in the background. And, okay, okay. So, you might think that's not a big deal. <laughs> 
But here's the thing. Let me let me let me back up. So this section that we're in, the chapter head says 1997. It's 1997 when this conversation is taking place. And probably we just spent five pages on the death of Princess Diana. Like, right, this, like, there was a scene where she goes, where Millie goes at, like, she's at her partner's house with his parents, and she gets up in the morning, and she goes out, and CNN is on, and they're talking about that Princess Diana has, has, you know, died in this horrible car accident. And so then we get five pages about her thinking about Princess Di and how awful the royal family is and how kind of maybe fake Princess Di was. It's just kind of strange. Anyway, so there's that. We've already got heavy pop, kind of pop culture or cultural moment reference. Okay, that's a historical thing and everybody remembers that. And so then she, she learns this thing and she calls Drew and then this thing of... Millie could hear Radiohead playing in the background. And, and I'm thinking, okay, why is that necessary to say that? Why is it necessary to say Millie could hear Radiohead playing in the background? I happen to be the same age as the character, Millie. She, would, she was 27 in 1997. I was 27 in 1997. And so I was also a Radiohead fan. So I happen to know even just off the top of my head, that Radiohead released an album in 1997 that was called OK Computer. And the big hit off of OK Computer was a song called Karma Police. And it's interesting to me that he drops this reference, the author drops this reference to Radiohead and just Ra Millie could hear Radiohead playing in the background. And then it just, the, the story just goes on. There's no other comment about Radiohead. There's no other reason. There's no reason to mention it. To make it a significant detail, to make it a meaningful detail, even if he couldn't get the rights to some of the lyrics, he could have just, said Millie could hear Radiohead's Karma Police playing in the background and, you know, thought, yeah, here I am. Here's my moment of karma. It takes so little. It takes so little to take a reference like that and make it a meaningful reference as opposed to just a throwaway, oh, this is who these people are. They listen to Radiohead. Well, we already know that. I mean, we're 50% we're of the way into the book, and I already know that. When she met Drew, I already I already know this because the, there was a whole thing about how Drew had Betty page bangs and glasses and Doc Martens or whatever. I, you know, you, these cultural markers, just there's a lot of things that are these types of references. And it's almost like they're standing in for character as opposed to informing the character. And that that kind of thing just really bothers me. I'll give you another, I'll give you two more examples. Another example is Drew uh, a few years earlier than with the conversation she has with Millie. A few years earlier, she had gone through, she'd had a problem with the drugs and she'd come out of it and she'd written a memoir. And it's, so it talks about this memoir that Drew has written and it says she's the anti-Elizabeth Wurzel. Her memoir was the anti, made her the anti-Elizabeth Wurzel. And I'm like, okay, show of hands out there. Who knows who Elizabeth Wurzel is right now, today? I'll tell you who she is. She's a, she's a woman Unfortunately, rest in peace, Elizabeth Wurzel. She died um, a year or two ago, I think. She wrote a memoir that was very popular in the 90s called Prozac Nation. But I'm thinking, how many people really are going to get this who are not Gen X people? Who is going to, who is really going to know who Elizabeth, A, Elizabeth Wurzel is? B, have read Prozac Nation, and then C, really understand what does that mean to be the anti-Elizabeth Wurzel? And also, if you're just anti what somebody else is, how does that inform the character, that character? What kind of character development is that? What does that really say? It doesn't say anything. 
It's just taking a pop culture reference and trying to make it seem like it's, it's somehow literarily relevant. It just, that kind of thing just really bothers me. And then the third one is Millie, fast forwarding again to 1997, Millie is, uh, has been going to this boy's home or this children's home and where she first sees a little boy that she's going to adopt. This is not a spoiler. We know from the beginning of the book that she has a son that she's adopted. So she's going to this, this home when the little boy is four years old and she's seeing him. And the first time she sees him, she says, you know, she notes what he's wearing and he has on a, he has on an oversized Yankees t-shirt, which makes sense in the, the story because the nun who runs the home is a big Yankees fan and is also kitted out in her Yankees gear. So that's fine. And then he's wearing painter shorts. Fine. And then he's wearing old Navy sneakers. Okay. He's wearing old Navy sneakers. And I'm thinking, why old Navy sneakers? Why the mention of Old Navy? And then several pages later, she goes back to visit him again. And this time she notices he's wearing knockoff Nike sneakers. I'm like, what? What? what why? Why the brand names? A, why is she noticing what he's wearing? Unless there's no thought about like, Obviously, you know, the poor kid, they're just pulling clothes out of a bin and they all share clothes and he doesn't have his own clothes. There's no interiority or her thinking about that or thinking about Mateo's life there at all. Honestly, she does not think about Mateo's life there at all. But there's these weird references to the shoes and they don't make any sense. Old Navy sneakers, what does that mean? Are they are Old Navy sneakers a particular thing? I don't remember them being particularly popular in 1997. What? I mean, would it, it just be more meaningful to say he was always dressed in cheap sneakers? Or maybe he always had on sneakers that looked a size too big? Or something that made it like, yeah, that's his life. And then she could she could also maybe really truly notice that and reflect on it. And think, wow, you know, these kids, they're in this, these boys, all the boys are from mothers who have, were HIV positive or who have AIDS. That's their situation or whose mothers have, the, and maybe they have, some of their mothers have died and some of their mothers just are too sick to take care of them. And she doesn't think about this at all. She does not talk about that at all. But there are these weird references to the sneakers. That's where her mind is. What? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would really be interested to know if these are the kinds of things that you notice and if they bother you or if I am just some kind of freak. <laughs> Probably it's the latter, but you know, I have great hope that you'll understand what I'm talking about. I, it's not that I mind brand names or details. Like there's a, there's a point where Millie goes on antidepressants and she says, you know, she's been depressed and she has to take a, a mild anti, she started taking a mild antidepressant. And then it says that she had started taking a mild antidepressant period. And then it says, Wellbutrin period. Why Wellbutrin? Why are you mentioning Wellbutrin? And then it mentions it like five or six more times. Wellbutrin, Wellbutrin. Well, is, is he getting a kickback? I don't know. <laughs> is this like product placement on Friends? I don't know. Anyway, it just bothers me. It just bothers me. It seems easy. It's facile. And it makes me wonder about the line between literary fiction. You know, I, I, I'm like, I don't know how this is literary. Why is this literary? And somebody like Curtis Sittenfeld isn't literary. Is it the subject matter? Is it just because it's about HIV and AIDS? Is it because it's multi-point of view, multi-timeline? Um, the writing is not any more literary than like Curtis Sittenfeld, who is considered commercial upmarket fiction. Or like a J. Courtney Sullivan, also commercial upmarket fiction. I'm trying to, to think of like, 
how, why, how or why is that? Where is the line? Um, these are the, these are the things that keep me up at night, people. I mean, it's not easy being me. It's just not easy. Obviously, <laughs> I need a hobby besides reading. Um, anyway, thank you for letting me rant. Uh, I would, I would really like to know if that bothers you. I think that if this was a, a book that was listed as contemporary fiction, if I felt like it was supposed to be a lighter read, these are things that I wouldn't notice. Like if I honestly, if I was reading a rom com, if I was reading like Catherine Center or somebody like that and she was dropping these references in this way it wouldn't bother me I would I would just be like oh yeah you know because it's all very cute and it's all very light and it's just it's all about pacing and plot and there's just not much but this is supposed to be literary fiction and there are all these these references that just they're just gratuitous references and it bothers me and it feel like it's it's not tight. It's not as tight as it could be. It's a little, I just don't like it when things like that stand in for real, real meaning, like who a person is, what a time is, what a place is. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, let me know if I'm, yeah, totally alone <laughs> or if you notice things like that, or if you have other literary pet peeves, where, you know, you're reading along and something just starts to ping at you and you just start to think, this is bothering me because honestly, I'm having a hard time reading the book because I pick it up and I keep noticing these things and I keep making little notes and highlighting them. <laughs> so, all right, I guess that's it for today. I've had my rant. I feel, I feel a little bit better. I hope that you have some fun weekend plans. We are just going to stay inside and try to stay as cool as possible. <laughs> we'll probably go out and sit on the stoop in the evenings because it'll probably be nicer out there than it is in here. Um, and, you know, we'll just, we'll just get through it. <laughs> so I hope that you all have a good weekend out there. Oh, I did forget to say one thing. I want to say thank you again. I know I had my little confetti moment last week for my three month anniversary, uh, but I also hit 750 subscribers. And thank you. Thank you. If you're still here, I know I should have said this at the beginning of the video, but thank you. If you're still here, uh, I appreciate it so much. I appreciate if you're a subscriber, I appreciate it. If you just drop by to visit and you watch this whole video and listen to me rant, I appreciate it. And uh, I, again, I hope that you have a great weekend and thank you so much for joining me and for just, you know, making my channel feel like a good place to be, I hope. Anyway, <laughs> I will talk to you guys next week. Okay, take care. Bye.